Basic Metaphysics, a lecture by Jonathan Barlow Gee. Part 1. The Taurus. To understand the shape and properties of four space manifolds, we begin with an examination of this familiar diagram displaying the standard elliptical orbit of a body in space around a dual focal point. The labels are as follows, clockwise from left to right. The sphere in orbit is labeled D. The orbit itself is labeled M. And the dual focal points are labeled ST and TS. The meanings of these labels is adumbrated on at length in my book, The Metaphysician's Desk Reference. However, their significance to this model is unimportant here, considering only the form of the model itself. The next form of this model shows us the orbital plane from along the edge, from which vantage we may see a further twist in the shape of the orbit such that it resembles a sideways figure 8, the symbol of infinity. Here, the labels remain the same as before. D signifies now two positions of the orb in its orbit around the dual foci, labeled here also ST and TS. The twisting orbit is labeled M. In this form of the model, we may see that due to the optical illusion formed by looking at the usual elliptical loop from along the edge, two points on opposite sides of the ellipse appear to converge in the center between the twin focal points. In the third iteration of this model, we symbolize this superposition of opposite points on the original ellipse by inserting a third position for D, the orbiting sphere. The label and shape of the orbit M remains a sideways figure 8, however now we see that this superposition point of illusory intersection can be symbolized by a third position of D, the body in space, that actually signifies two foreshortened and visually overlapping points in the elliptical orbit M from the original diagram. Thus, we may now also see that this third superposition point for D along M has an equator co-circumferential to the circle, originally signifying the dual focal points, such that this superimposed midpoint position for D sits within the center between the focal points ST and TS. In this next form of the original model, we further elaborate on the superposition midpoint of the orbiting sphere, D, by proportioning upon it the usual depiction for the effect on its poles of precession, labeled P. The semblance of this addition shows that an upward pointed cone tapers asymptotically in an arced surface from a circular base below the midpoint of D, the orb, while another identical cone points downward from above such that the tips of the two arced cones intersect in the center of the midpoint of D. In this form of the model, we may see the co-circumferential equatorial circle signifying the conical angle of the orb, D's, polar precession are perpendicular on the left and right sides of the twisted figure 8 orbital ellipse, M, to the position of them relative to the central overlapping position of the sphere D in its orbit. In short, we see the midpoint position of D operates at a right angle to the orientation of D on the left and right. Thus, as I am attempted to prove in my book, the MPDR, the orbit of the precessing poles of D forms the exterior and the sideways figure 8 angle of the ellipse form the interior of a standard four-space torus. What we are seeing in this final form of the original model is one-half of a torus. In this complete model of a torus, we see the manner the four-space torus evolves from one-space singularity. First, the point expands into a line shown here operating at a right angle along a vertical axis in purple. 
This line is then rotated at this angle around its singularity origin point to form a plane, which is shown as the red spiral in the middle signifying polar precession. This red spiral line traces the plane space surface of the line's rotation around its midpoint as a wavelength, shown in yellow, signifying the equator of the torus. The red spiral line on this plane surface also rotates around itself, and this is shown expanded as the blue spirals on the left and right connected around the toroid equator as a green coil. This gives us all the motions that a point on a torus can move along. The essential concept of the torus is that it it is a four-space expansion of the one-space singularity in four directions. The resulting shape is essentially as appears here and is called a torus or hypersphere. The usual nomenclature distinction between these terms is that a torus is a hypersphere seen from along its equatorial side, while a hypersphere is a torus seen from above its polar axis. In this diagram, again from my book, the MPDR, we may see that a toroid equator surrounds the nested hypersphere. The concept of the torus or hypersphere is that it is a sphere within a sphere where both spheres have the same volume, symbolizing a single sphere moving in the invisible direction of time. The torus, as we see here from above one pole on the left, and from above the opposite pole on the right, obeys the laws of wave mechanics and in turn determines the wavelength motion of spherical particles. We see the three directions of possible motion that a point on a torus can travel in as a large blue arrow around the toroid's exterior circumference, as a series of small green arrows signifying particle rotation inside the toroid, either in the inner or outer hypersphere, and as a red wavelength measuring a spiral line drawn along the plane surface of the toroid equator. To return to the complete toroid form of the original model from the MPDR, we see the combination of the motions within the inner sphere and upon the exterior sphere cause the polar precession of a point as it moves along all these possible directions over time. As a point moves along an elliptical orbit, the poles of the point precess such that over time they reverse orientation, first at a right angle, then to 180 degrees opposite from their original orientation, and finally back again. This perpetual cycle forms the overall model of a four-space torus from the side or hypersphere from above. Because this depiction itself is flat, we may see it as a shadow of this higher dimensional shape cast onto a 2D plane space. Because a torus is 4D, it also casts a 3D shadow. The shadow of the hypersphere is the simple 3D orb, but the shadow of the torus, a hypersphere seen from the side, is shaped like a circularly self-connected tube. This tube has a circular circumference, however if you were to trace the motion of a single point on the exterior surface of the toroid circumference, you would follow it as it formed a phi spiral. If you were to take the phi spiral formed on the exterior surface of a torus as it revolves inward on itself and combine it with the pi spiral motion of a point on the interior of the torus as it revolves around in a circular tube, the result would be this diagram showing the shadows of these two types of spiral, the exponential phi and the arithmetic pi on a flat plane space with their twin origin points exactly overlapped. The significance of combining these two spirals as flat shadows in this way is to depict the point where the interior of the torus becomes the exterior of the torus as a parameter where both spirals, 
inner pi and outer phi coincide. For shorthand, I refer to this pair of spirals throughout all my writings on metaphysics as a single phi over pi spiral. When we double such an already combined phi over pi spiral with an exact duplicate of itself in mere reflection by overlapping both centroids onto a single origin point, we arrive at this depiction which is best thought of as a shadow cast by the motions of a point on a hypersphere seen from above or below one of its poles. When we double the phi over pi spirals at a point along their axis line, but not exactly overlapping one another on a conjoined origin point, we arrive at this model, best seen as a shadow depiction of point motion along the toroid edge or the hypersphere seen from the side. If we flatten the motion of a point on a torus surface into a plane, the result is this autocorrelated mapping, the so-called seven-color coding pattern of the surface of a torus. When the space labeled 1 is connected to the space labeled 7, inside a coil formed by the spaces between 1 through 7, we see yet another form of the torus, or hypersphere, seen from along its equator. This seven-color coating maps onto the surface of the round tube torus such that it forms the phi spiral upon it. Part 2. The Tesseract To begin our examination of the four space manifolds based on geometric polygons besides the simple circle expanded from the singular origin point down the center of a line, we look first toward the tesseract or hypercube. The three space shadow of the four space hypercube is the regular cube with six square shaped sides, twelve edge lines, and eight corners where three edge lines connect three square faces all at 90 degree angles. The standard terms of measurement for the dimensions implied by these three edge intersecting corners oriented at right angles to one another are length or distance, breadth or width, and depth or volume. The hypercube is a symbolic depiction of a single cube changing over time and is represented by two cubes overlapping. The standard form of the hypercube is as one cube nested within another cube. This depiction is an optical illusion symbolizing the true shape of a hypercube, however is itself merely a flat 2D shadow of the true form of such. A real four-space hypercube is comprised of twin cubes, both of equal volume, while in this standard symbolic depiction in 2D of the shape of the 4D manifold, the inner cube appears to have smaller volume than the larger cube that it is nested within. Because of the intersection of the three vertices at the origin of length, width, and depth, there are three shadows in two space that can be cast to show the true form of the four space hypercube. The first was the nested hypercube seen from above one of the midpoints of one of its sides. The second is this combination where one cube sits on top of a second of exactly equal area, which signifies the shadow cast from a hypercube when viewed above the midpoint of one of its linear edges. This format is called the hypercube's antipode position. The third form of 2D shadow cast by the 4D hypercube is the tesseract. The outline in flat two space of the tesseract is octagonal or eight-sided and eight-pointed. This outline contains an arrangement of horizontal, vertical, 
and diagonal lines that forms, at the center of the shape, a smaller star pattern called an octogram. The octagon and octogram are, to the 4D hypercube, the equivalent to, in two space, the line and dot. The octogram contained within the octagon itself also contains an octagon, and this pattern can be self-replicated on smaller and larger scales infinitely. Because it is a gnomon, a form of parallelogram similar to the more organic patterns of fractals. The apparently octagonal shadow cast by the four-space tesseract is also an optical illusion that symbolizes the dual cube arrangement. In this depiction, we see that one cube, shown in red, is oriented at a 45-degree angle to the other cube, shown in blue. As each corner of one cube shifts along this angle to connect to the same corner of the other cube, it forms the lines inside the octagon that define the 2D depiction of the tesseract. The pattern depicted in this flat 2D shape is merely the shadow of a hypercube seen from above one of its corners in 4 space. Because the 4D hypercube spans as a measure of distance, the change we consider a temporal duration by using the motif of two cubes of the same volume. It changes the shape of the shadow it casts in 3D by motion, just as in 2 space its shadow is determined by orientation to the hypercube of the point of view. The hypercube's shadow in 3 space thus appears to transform endlessly just as in 2 space it had exactly three shadows cast from different points of view. While the nested antipode and tesseract hypercube patterns in 2D reflect the faces, edges, and corners of the 3D shapes length width and depth form in 4D, the true form of the tesseract expresses the fourth dimensional direction, or change over time, as motion in the orientation between two equal volumed cubes. Here is a depiction of the motion of the tesseract through itself, as one cube trades places with the other by both passing through one another. Here is another simulation of a hypercube to demonstrate the change in size between the two cubes as they pass through one another affects motion using a sphere moving forward in a line to signify the standard arrow of entropy, i.e. time. Because the hypercube is a four-space manifold object, it is not visually depictable without using motion. It is commonly known as having countless 2D visual depictions describing shadows cast by the hypercube when it is seen from various angles. These sorts of 2D pictures hint at further applications of studying the tesseract shadows by applying them to a 3D model as directions of motion. When we use this method, we may see that there are four axes of the 3D shadow of the four-space cube. The first two-space shadow we follow as a direction of motion along an axis in the 3D shadow of the 4D hypercube shows the single cube rising vertically. Next, we see the hypercube's motion along the antipode angle, where it elongates to the length of the double cube at its midpoint, rising up the vertical axis. The next form of spatial shadow we see cast within the three-space model is a triangle morphing along the horizontal axis. The fourth iteration of motion inside the 3D hypercube's shadow is also along the horizontal axis. 
this morphing process is called a slice that cuts from corner to corner of the 3D shadow of a tesseract. At one corner, it begins as a tetrahedron, expands in its midpoint into an octahedron, and then collapses again to a tetrahedron at the opposite corner. The presence of the dual tetrahedrons at opposite corners of the tesseract slice is significant because it implies the presence of another form of hypershape, the hypertetrahedron, shown here as one tetrahedron of smaller volume nested inside another of larger volume, signifying the higher dimensional equation of their volumes as change along the invisible axis of time. The same nesting of the hypercube shows it from above one side and is one of the three such axial shadows in 2D cast from the hypercube because the cube connects three edged sides at each corner. A tetrahedron has a total of only four sides with each corner connecting three edged faces like the cube. The nested tetrahedrons of different volumes show the 4D hypertetrahedron's 3D shadow from above one of its sides. A stelloctahedron is the co-origin point nesting of two equal volume tetrahedrons. It is the equivalent for the hypertetrahedron of the equal volume pair of cubes at antipode for the hypercube. It shows the hypertetrahedron from above one of its edges. The final form of shadow cast by the hypertetrahedron explains why it appears within the slice from corner to corner of the hypercube. Because a stalactahedron can be formed between eight equidistant corners, it can also be nested within a 3D cube. When this is done and the shadow of the form is cast onto a 2D plane space, the shape it assumes is this, a unicursal hexagram formed of two pentagrams, one upright above and one inverse below, surrounded by a hexagon. The exterior circumference of the hexagon is formed from the shadow cast by the cube. When this is removed, the interior lines that remain connecting the six points are the shadow in a 2D plane space of the stelloctahedron in 3D. This signifies the cubical hypertetrahedron's shadow when cast from a point of view above one of its corners. This is also why it appears in the diagonal slice from corner to corner in the hypercube. Part 3. The Hypercross The tesseract shape in 2D signifies the motion of a 3D cube along the 4D axis of time. The nested hypercube shape in 2D signifies the stationary midpoint of this motion as the shadow of a 3D model where the two cubes are not of equal volume. At antipode point, seen from above one of the cube's edges, rather than sides as in the nested position or corners as in the tesseract pattern, there appear to be twin cubes of equal volume, one above the other below. This final form was known to ancient metaphysicians, who designed a shape to signify the antipode hypercube in flat 2D space using two hexagons overlapping such that the upper hexagon's lowest corner overlaps the midpoint of the lower hexagon and the lower hexagon's upper corner overlaps the midpoint of the upper hexagon. This shape signifies the antipode hypercube seen from above a corner as a 3D model then recast as a shadow onto a 2D plane space also from a point of view directly above one corner of the 3D model. They called this model Hakabalah, meaning literally the body of God. 
the modern form of this ancient lattice pattern shows the same essential shape with one significant discrepancy. The middle pillar of Sephiroth points on the vertical axis have slipped down such that now the lowest point is subtended below the lower hexagon. This symbolizes, for the hypercube, the same unfolding idea as may be applied to tessellating the sides of a three-space cube. Here we see how the six sides of the standard regular cube unfold into a single plane space pattern as a tessellation of the six square-shaped sides. The resulting shape is commonly called the Calvary cross pattern, such that four of the square sides surround a fifth, while below the lowest of these is subtended the sixth square side. When a hypercube is unfolded into a 3D tessellated pattern, the result is called a hypercross. Because the shadow cast by the nested hypercube is the same in plane space as that of a three-space cube seen from directly above one side, the same effect should be expected to occur for the shape of the hypercross, such that it would cast a three-space shadow of multiple cubes, but in two-space assume the same form as the unfolded cube that being the common Calvary cross. It is also believed that when a hypercube is unfolded into a three-space shape, that the form it would take would be comprised of eight cubes, one for each corner of the standard three-space regular cube. This reasoning yields a 3D version of a Calvary pattern hypercross, where each of the six sides of a central cube expand into six cubes added to the original seventh, wherein the eighth cube is subtended to the lowest cube. Just as the 2D Calvary cross pattern is not a single source shadow, but shows the tessellation of all six square-shaped sides of the 3D cube, the two-space shadow of the morphing tesseract appears the same as that of a rotating cube, and likewise the shadow in two-space of the 3D Calvary pattern model of a hypercross should be expected to show the regular tessellation of six squares of the flat two-space Calvary cross motif. However, the shadow in two-space of the 3D model of a Calvary version of a 4D hypercross does not show the same shape as the regular 2D Calvary cross of six squares. Instead, the shadow in two space shows up as a simple five square cross where four squares of equal area surround a central fifth. Thus, the actual shape of the hypercross is not a Calvary pattern with a subtended eighth cube below the lowest cube of six surrounding a central seventh on all its square sides. It is actually, as shown here as a 2D depiction of a 3D model, only the six cubes surrounding the central seventh. However, there does exist an extra eighth cube. Only in this form, seen from above the hypercross corner, as opposed to along its edge, as in the Calvary arrangement, the eighth cube is hidden in plain sight in the spaces between the six cubes surrounding the central seventh. The eighth cube appears as a framework shadow in two space between the shadows of the six cubes and the shadow of the central seventh in the form of a Roger Penrose or impossible cube, so called for being an optical illusion in which the edges of a regular 3D cube are solid, but appear such that the background legs overlap those usually seen in the front. 
when such an impossible optical illusion shape as the Penrose cube casts a shadow in two space, it is the same shadow as that which would usually be cast by the shape of a regular 3D cube. Just as we saw the antipode cubes as paired hexagons in the diagram of Hakabalah, so in the 2D shadow of the 3D model of the 4D hypercross, we see a hexagon shape cast from above the corner of an impossible cube. Part 4. Hypershapes. Aside from the singularity or sphere whose hypershape is the nested hypersphere or torus, there are five regular polygonal solid forms in three space that may have counterpart hypershapes in higher dimensional hyperspace. These five regular solids are commonly called the platonic solids and they include the cube of 12 edges, 8 corners, and 6 square shaped sides, the tetrahedron of 6 edges, 4 corners, and 4 triangular sides, the octahedron of 8 edges, 7 corners, and eight triangular sides, the isosahedron of 15 edges, 12 corners, and 20 triangular sides, and finally the dodecahedron of 35 edges, 20 corners, and 12 pentagonal sides. The secret of understanding the hypershape forms of these five regular 3D solids lies with the additional truncated or snub versions of these original five, which are commonly called the 16 Archimedean solids. These 16 mixed polygonal solids comprise the space occurring within and between these original five solids when they are nested within their own shapes or within one another. We begin by re-examining the cube. Its six sides intersecting in three vertices per corner are the only use of the regular square shape in any of the five platonic 3D solids. From above one of its eight corners the 2D shadow cast by the 3 cube in flat plane space is a hexagon. Likewise, because a cube can be divided apart into a pair of intersecting tetrahedrons, a stelloctahedron, the hypershape of the tetrahedron, can be extrapolated from inside a 3 cube, just as a hexagram hides inside the hexagon shadow of the cube in 2 space. When we examine the hypershape of the tetrahedron further, we find that, similarly to the impossible eighth cube within and between the other seven in a regular hypercross, if we were to unfold the hypertetrahedron as a flat 2D shadow, it would tessellate onto a flat plane space below the 3D shape of the stelloctahedron in the shape of an impossible triangle hidden within and between the twin tetrahedrons. This impossible triangle is a 2D optical illusion formed by the unfolding and tessellating onto a flat surface of the edges of the stelloctahedron. The next larger form of regular 3D solid with all equilateral triangular sides is the isosahedron. Its hypershape casts as many various forms of 3D shadow as it has edges, corners, and sides. Here we see one such depicting this as a yellow cube connecting the interior corners of a hyper isosahedron formed by nesting one isosahedron of smaller area upside down 
within another of larger area. Thus, just as the tetrahedron can be doubly nested within the regular cube, so too can a cube be singularly nested within a doubled isosahedron. The isosahedron can not only nest within itself a perfectly regular three-space cube formed inside a hyper-isosahedron that is nested within itself. It can also house the next higher order shape, the dodecahedron. Here we begin to see the role played by the 16 Archimedean solids as occurring between these dual nested forms such that between the outer isosahedron in blue and the inner dodecahedron in green we find the now familiar stalactahedron shape in purple. Thus we begin to see that one level of hypershape occurs between two nested forms of regular solid. Likewise the Archimedean solids occur as slices from one corner to another of these hypershapes. The dodecahedron of 12 pentagonal shaped sides likewise can serve as a hypershape which has a smaller backwards nested version of the form within a larger version of itself. However, even in this form, the hyperdodecahedron can also nest within itself another of the five regular platonic solid forms on the next lower level of complexity, the isosahedron. We see here the outer dodecahedron in green, the inner isosahedron in blue, and the hyper dodecahedron portrayed as the stellation of an Archimedean solid between them in purple. The hyper dodecahedron, however, has 35 edges and 20 corners in addition to its 12 sides of 5 edges each. Thus, to depict these additional sums as 3D modeled shadows of the hyper dodecahedron, we see here nested inside the regular 3D dodecahedron in blue, a cube in green, a tetrahedron in yellow, and an octahedron in red. Again, the spaces between these nested regular solids form the truncated and snub 16 Archimedean solids. All hypershapes in 4D can be modeled by combining these five basic polygonal solids in 3-space by nesting them with one another. And these five solids are in turn comprised of the only three flat regular polygons, the pentagon, square, and triangle. In my book, The MPDR, I refer to such hypershapes throughout as metaforms. Basic Metaphysics, a lecture by Jonathan Barlow Gee. Advanced Metaphysics, a lecture by Jonathan Barlow Gee. Electrons. In the Bohm model of the atom, we see here the magnetically attractive atomic nucleus surrounded by the magnetically repelled electron cloud of varying orbital shell energy levels. Of course we know this model is greatly oversimplified from the real world orbital paths taken by the electron in its orbital shell. We can only predict these roughly using interactions from the photoelectric effect. Thus, as we see in the standard Bohm model, there is a substrata allocated in this diagram of mind between the positive nucleus and the negative electron, and this inner shell reflects the ability of an electron to temporarily store a photon. First, let us examine the electromagnetic effect that causes attraction between atoms 
to form covalently bonded molecules. For the purpose of demonstration, we assume the magnetically positive poles to form an axis around the middle of which develops the magnetically negative electron's orbital shell's rough equator. We see the magnetically attractive poles here in green and the equator of the electron shell at a right angle to them, we see as a red circle surrounding the green line. Thus, there are two forms of electromagnetic conductivity that can occur as a result of aligning electrons, based on whether the electrons are aligned along the axis of their poles or along their equatorial circumference. When the wavelength is of magnetically aligned electrons that are oriented along their magnetically attractive polar axis, the result is called direct current, which offers unrestricted capacitance, limited in an inverse exponential amount by distance, determined by the medium through which the electricity is channeled. The other form of electromagnetism occurs when the electrons are being magnetically aligned along their equatorial circumferences and is called alternating current because magnetically positive capacitance will alternate with magnetically negative resistance along this form of wavelength. Because the positively magnetic polar axis is perpendicular to the equatorial circumference of the negatively magnetic electron's orbital shell, and because these can both be aligned into patterns along wavelengths by orienting them using magnetism, the electromagnetic force can be graphed as two wavelengths as we see here in green for the magnetically positive polar axis and red for the magnetically negative electron's equator along a single central axis for both, however, that operate at a right angle to one another. Because these combined forms of electron alignment according to magnetism combine to form the single force of the electromagnetic spectrum, and because of the discovery of the electromagnetic force's interaction with electromagnetically neutral photons, the so-called photoelectric effect, we cannot discuss the combination of these three components to form the electromagnetic force's full spectrum without discussing the photoelectric effect as well. To do this, we will next discuss photons, which combine with AC and DC forms of aligned electron wavelengths to comprise the full electromagnetic forces spectrum. Photons For photons, first we examine them according to a form of electronic schematic designed by Richard Feynman. According to Feynman's initial premise, a magnetically neutral photon occurs when a magnetically attractive positron combines for some period of time with a magnetically repulsive electron. We see here now, according to Feynman's model, a positron and electron can cooperate for a duration as a photon wavelength and then once again break apart to emit a single positron and a single electron. This positron-electron pairing may be what results in the effects we observe from the classical double-slit experiment, often touted as proving light acts holographically. It appears that when interrupted by interference with the solid material object, a photon wavelength will break into multiple parts, and each part will travel simultaneously through all of the multiple slits or permeations through the material interference. The light expresses this doubling effect in the form of losing half its luminosity, and it seems to be this that accounts for the inverse square law of light diminishing with distance from the source of its emission. Here we see a potential extended form of the double slit experiment using six material barriers, each with either two or three permeations, or slits. According to my predictions, we can extrapolate various frequencies of wavelengths by controlling their refraction in this way. 
The resultant wave pattern formed on an emissions receiver at the opposite side of the interfering obstructions would have as many points of origin as obstructions, and we can see using the six-walled form of the double-slit experiment that the emission spectrum on the receiver would resemble the hexagonal arrangement of the quantum chromodynamics applying to stable forms of quarks. To further break this model down, we can see how a wavelength divided by four layers of obstructive interference would refract into four points of origin surrounded by ripples outward of less and less often placed randomly scattered positron-electron repairings. Here we see that by applying this same method of light refraction using four walls of interference to graph a pattern on a flat receiver, we can measure a Lorentz transform of the surface motion on the topology of a torus aligned along a single axis penetrating it perpendicularly to its interior axis and to its exterior equator. The topological pattern of the torus, such as we see here, can seem complex. There is a horizontal wavelength penetrating the torus along its latitudinal equator in yellow. The outermost circumference of the torus is comprised of a coil that in the diagram is colored green from the outside and blue inside. The latitudinal spiral in red traces from the equator to the processing polar axis, the offset vertical angled purple line. The photoelectric effect. Having now studied how magnetic electrons behave in AC and DC voltage currents and how photons combine a positron and electron that can be infinitely divided in halves, diminishing its luminosity according to the inverse square law, let us now study the combination of the electromagnetic force spectrum and the photoelectric effect. The photoelectric effect is known to us simply by colors. The wavelengths of photons that transmit light received to our eyes from all the objects we can see are caused to assume certain colors of the rainbow spectrum by the composition of the elements they are reflecting off of. This reaction occurs such that all the atomic elements and thus all the larger molecular forms of matter reflect one hue of light and refract it to bounce off at another angle and another frequency, carrying a frequency of wavelength our eyes would interpret as a different color. The spectral chromatic effect can only occur because photon wavelengths of one frequency or color will reflect off electron energy shells of various different levels and sums of electrons on each per atomic element as a different frequency or color of light. The photoelectric effect can be modeled as I have here, using a green circle to signify the electron's orbit in its energy shell level, red to signify an approaching photon prior to impact with and absorption into the electron's orbital energy shell level, and blue to signify a retreating photon following ejection and emission from the electron's orbital energy shell level. This aspect of the photoelectric effect, that the massless photon is absorbed into the electron's energy shell for any duration at all, regardless of how briefly, before being immediately reflected off its surface, has long puzzled quantum mechanics. The frequency of the photon wavelength prior to impact appears as one chromatic hue on the visible spectrum and another after reflection off its surface because the trajectory of the photon wavelength is, for a fraction of an instant, combined with that of the electron inside its orbital energy shell. The result is the electron assumes mass enough to be measured during this duration while the photon and electron are combined, such is the essence of quantum mechanics. This occurs along the electron's orbital energy shell level 
and an arc radian angle determined by a ratio of before and after collision trajectories of the light wave and thus its chromatic tone that quantum mechanics call theta. As theta diminishes asymptotically towards zero, the closer to the nucleus the photon wavelength penetrates, the angle of refraction, denoted usually by phi, expands. The duration of time the photoelectric effect can last can thus also approach a zero sum. In this Feynman type diagram, I have attempted to model the photoelectric effect where T, its duration, asymptotically approaches a zero point at a right angle of origin. The electron is modeled as the green and red perpendicular wavelengths, while the photon is modeled as a single wavelength in blue. Quantum mechanics refer to the apparent zero time duration of the photoelectric effect, wherein the photon is absorbed into the electron, illuminating it prior to its being reflected off its surface in an altered trajectory, quantum tunneling. Here is a model of quantum tunneling that may be applied on an intergalactic as well as subquantum level. We see a negative electron and a neutral photon can combine to form a positive quantum tunnel which acts in a large enough mass aggregate like a wormhole that cuts vast distances in space down to approaching zero duration travel time. To return to the photoelectric effect, we find that the frequency of a photon wavelength translates into the momentum of the photon particle during the zero time event while any photon collides with any stable electron energy shell. The momentum and trajectory of the photon particle combine with the prior trajectory of the magnetically negative electron to cancel its charge just long enough for it to be observed. In the same exact moment, the photon wavelength bounces off the electron energy shell with a frequency comprised of a combination of its previous particle trajectory and that taken by the electron orbiting in its energy shell. Following the photoelectric effect, the frequency and color of the wavelength is altered, and the electron ceases being a measurable particle and resumes its apparent occupation of all points on its orbital energy shell simultaneously. A light cone. First let us consider the three possible curvatures of the fabric of the space-time continuum. All of these occur in different places in space, around various sorts of orbs or clouds, However, the one that adds up to occur the most determines the overall shape of the majority of the space-time continuum itself. The saddle form signifies a cyclical Big Bang and Big Crunch, alternating explosion and implosion of the entire universe. The sphere geometry signifies a single, fixed aspect ratio for the expansion of space over time, such that at a certain predetermined critical mass point the universe would simply stop changing over time and everything would hold still for eternity. The final potential geometry defining space-time shapes it into flat planes usually in spirals such as in the accretion of stars into spiral galactic disks and the double helix formation of molecules into biological DNA. This morphology means a timeline of perpetual expansion at a fixed rate. Secondly, we consider the method we use to slice backward in time through all these potential geometric patterns for the fabric of our space-time continuum, that is, creating a 4D cone with a circulating base and a singularity at its apex. The axis of rotation of the base is assumed to be a factor determined by the base's midpoint's relation to the conical apex. We call this axis the observer's line of sight. 
The circulating base revolves around the midpoint according to a trajectory determined by the angle of an axis connecting the base's midpoint to the conical apex. When we apply the 4D light cone method to measuring the expanding history of the universe, we trace the origin point of our continuum's surface to a central singularity, the Big Bang, and for shorthand depiction assume the traditional expansion model of a sphere. In this model, the curvature of present space-time causes a lens effect to occur as we look back through time towards the first spark of the Big Bang, similar to a double-slit experiment with no interfering obstacles. Modern cosmology has improved on this method only by modifying the curvature of space-time's effect on the model of the light cone to depict various levels at which the rate of expansion has slowed or sped up. It should also be recalled that, in different locations in space, various different types of curvature can occur as well. For example, in addition to the direct line of sight from an observer looking backward through time toward the Big Bang, we see the formation of wormholes, baby universes, and intergalactic alignments. These same effects can all be incorporated as occurring inside this model of my own design based on a strong gravitational curvature to the continuum's historical light cone caused between the Big Bang and the point of critical mass by the singularity of the Big Bang itself. The resultant curved light cone shows the division of the four elemental forces between the Big Bang and the point of critical mass. The observer's line of sight is shown as the dotted arc. In this model, also of my own design, we see the light cone history of the universe from the Big Bang until critical mass, in black, occurs inside a larger temporal pattern depicted as Aleph sub N in blue at a 45 degree angle and as Aleph sub sigma in red at a right angle. This pattern forms the interior hole in the Aleph sub omega hypersphere, depicted as a green circle. Surrounding this entire cosmological process is the Tau sub Tau tesseract, symbolizing the method of measuring time. Cosmological model. We begin from the furthest measurement outside of the pattern that comprises the history of our universal timeline, at the level of the Tau sub Tau tesseract, symbolizing the measurement of time over space. As we begin to zoom inwards, we pass the exterior ring of the Aleph sub Omega Taurus and approach the interior pattern of perpetual recreation in the innermost engine of our universal pattern. As we approach closer still, we see our present universe in the circle on the left of the diagram, the Big Bang Singularity event expanded in the central circle, and in the circle on the right is expressed a geometric representation of the Nulliverse on the opposite side of this cyclical pattern from our own present universe. In this excerption, of only the engine of creation pattern from the innermost core of the Tau sub Tau tesseract, we see the Big Bang and expanding singularity is given as the Aleph sub Sigma Taurus in red. The present universe and its warped light cone are depicted as the Aleph sub Zero and Aleph sub Infinity timelines on the half of the diagram in green. The nulliverse of pure antimatter zero-point energy is shown as the opposite half of the torus in the diagram as the Aleph sub N subtorus in blue. In this expanded depiction of the geometry of the Aleph sub sigma warped torus form, showing the overall shape of the space-time continuum as an expanded pattern over its entire cyclical pattern, 
we see the warped light cone of our own universe's history on the lower left, the nulliverse of ZPE on the right, and between them the engine of creation, expansion of the Big Bang event that began the expansion of our present universal singularity. Here we see only the heart of the engine of creation pattern, the expansion of the event of the Big Bang, beginning the expansion of our universal continuum from the pre-universal singularity. We see electric force lines shown as a torus in blue, conical magnetic field lines in red, and between them the warped saddle shape of a perpetually recycling continuum's geometry. Following from this, to the left side of the Aleph sub sigma torus diagrams seen previous, we return to the original warped form of a light cone model I proposed, depicting the division of the four elemental forces between the Big Bang and the point when the universe reached critical mass. Finally, expanding on the central circle showing the universe's complexification within a temporally stationary contraction of space, we find this torus seen from above the midpoint of its central hole showing baby universes occurring perpendicular to black holes interconnected by parallel dimensional wormholes in a multiverse of n potential alternative timelines. Multiversal time space defines the outer circle in this diagram and the inner circle depicting the torus shaped central hole represents the space-time speed of our own universal continuum's photon fabric. The Four Forces To examine the division of the four elemental forces of energy in the universe, following the Big Bang, but prior to the point when the universe reached critical mass and began to devour itself from within like a hungry stomach, we can use graphs such as this one, with only modifications by myself from the original model proposed by Michio Keiku in his book Hyperspace. The evolution of the elements during the first Planck time following the Big Bang is plotted as proceeding from the upper left to the lower right along the diagonal of the square lattice. The first to form is Einsteinian gravity the so-called gravitational constant of general relativity. The second is Maxwell radiation, classed as photic and EM radiation. The third are Yang-Mills type particles, comprising the weak nuclear force of fission. The fourth and final to form prior to critical mass were the quark and lepton real particles of solid matter, held together through presumably, nuclear fusion. The question marks along the diagonal axis where the vertical columns and horizontal rows signifying the four elements intersect signify the energy level at which the elementary energy forces recombine and approach total reunification. In this diagram, an extension of the previous diagram to signify five elemental forces prior to the sixth state of critical mass, we find the traditional order of formation of the four forces following the Big Bang constituting the prime or fifth element. First, following the Big Bang, gravity formed, then photic light, then the nuclear force carrying particles, then quarks and leptons, and finally critical mass occurred. Replacing the question marks from the previous diagrams are miniature versions of a transform given by Stephen Hawking and Roger Penrose. In this picture we see my own hand-copied depiction of this Hawking-Penrose transform. This graph shows the way space-time drops off rapidly into a deep warping surrounding the event horizon of a black hole. Here again we see the form of a Poincare slice of a torus, the same results produced from a four-walled double-slit experiment. 
by substituting the Hawking Penrose transform graph showing the event horizon's warping of space time surrounding a black hole for the previous question marked diagram. We arrive at this model where the one Hawking Penrose transform applies to the reunification energy for all four elemental forces. The results are the different warpings to the fabric of space-time shown on the right. In this final form of the preceding diagrams, we see the division of the four elemental forces during the first expansion immediately following the Big Bang. We see the Hawking-Penrose transform as the point care section of a torus symbolizing the temperature of energy excitation at which the four elemental forces reunify. Gravity we see in black, electromagnetism in blue, fusion in green, and fission in red. On the left side of this diagram we see also applied the mnemonic pattern of expansion rate at which the four elemental forces divided from one another in their initial temperature conditions just after the Big Bang. Black Holes and Wormholes Black holes occur when a star grows old and large enough it implodes and creates a deep gravity well in space-time. Black holes swallow matter and energy and invert them into equal quantities of antimatter and so-called dark energy. This inflates a relativistically smaller singularity to form a baby universe inside each black hole. Wormholes occur on the surface of black holes event horizons and result in deep space gamma ray eruptions occurring apparently at random. These gamma ray eruptions occur in between them when spiral galaxies formed around the equators of black holes align with one another. In this diagram we see the poles of a black hole emitting gas jets that circle around in the deepest voids between galactic filaments to form baby universes. The angle of the gas jets bending around at which a baby universe begins to form is given as theta, the same as the interaction of the photoelectric effect in quantum mechanics. As theta approaches zero, the gas jets arc further and further out into deeper and deeper space, encompassing larger and larger arcs, interacting with and connecting them gravitationally to other distant neighboring galaxies. Here we can see how this process relates to our own Milky Way wherein the same gas jets that form the deep space baby universes, such as that on the left, connect in shorter arcs, such as those on the right, to our own star's poles, and from there to those of our planet, etc. In this picture we show the gravitic wavelengths connecting our star to the black hole at the center of our Milky Way galaxy. In green and blue, at right angles to one another, we see positive gravity waves A and B combining to form positive gravity field A in red. As the gravity waves emitted from galactic core by the central black hole there pass through our star, the Sun, they result in occasional reversals of the solar electromagnetic poles. Just as wormholes form on the surface of black holes at the cores of spiral galaxies, so too does the sunspot cycle reflect the effect on the north and south oriented magnetic poles of the black hole and all its galaxy stars. As the north and south poles of the galactic core's black hole process over time, they alter the effects on the sunspot cycle of their galaxy's stars that eventually result in electromagnetic polar reversal in stars and their accompanying planets. As the poles process their orientation over time, each electromagnetically reverses with respect to the others. For a planet in a roughly circular solar orbit, 
and for a star in a spiral galaxy. There will be a total of eight planetary pull reversals per every four solar pull reversals per each single pull reversal of the black hole at galactic core. EM pull reversals of the gas jets of the black hole at the core of a spiral galaxy occur when one galaxy aligns with another at a right angle. When the gas jets of two distant black holes align at right angles, a wormhole forms between our own universe and a baby universe between them, resulting in a gamma ray explosion in deep space between these galaxies. When an EM pole reversal occurs for a black hole in the center of a spiral galaxy, it promotes the precession of the polar axis and also results in a rippling effect as all the rest of the stars outward from the core of the spiral galaxy undergo an EM pole reversal at their own intervals. When two galaxies align at right angles from one another's core black holes, the galactic core's black holes poles reverse, and from there the pole reversal emanates outward toward the other planets in the galaxy's spiral accretion disk, affecting first each star, and then the planets of each star, and finally the moons of any such planets that have any. Advanced Metaphysics, a lecture by Jonathan Barlow Gee.